Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Sayedna, if you will lead us in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. O Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, Come, O oh good one, and dwell in us. Cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls. Thank you, Sayedna. Tonight we are greatly blessed, because here in our presence is not only a great man, Bishop Nicholas Samra, but something more than that, something more than a man. Because tonight, here in this hall, we have a bishop with us, a bishop of the church. We also have the priests of the church here, and we have a number of deacons that are here with us, and we have the lay faithful. The fullness of the church is here present in this room tonight, and we are very blessed for that. As St. Ignatius of Antioch said, writing in the very early 2nd century, you all, some of you remember when we studied the life of St. Ignatius of Antioch, and he says that where the bishop is, there is the gathering of the faithful. Just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And I know some of the people that are here tonight are not Catholic, some watching online, and you say, here we go again about the saints and the bishops and the hierarchy. What about Jesus Christ? Now listen to me, you missed the boat, because the greatest gift that God has ever given us is not that he has hoarded his love and his life, but that he has freely shared that life with us. He's freely shared it. And so within the church, as St. Paul says, there's a full hierarchy of life, an organic life that is lived. One is a hand and one is a foot. One is the heart and one are the eyes. Each one of us participating in the fullness of Jesus Christ. Where the Catholic Church is, there is Jesus Christ. Each one of us then has been given that gift of God's love to go out to take what we've received, to receive that gift, and then take that out to those that are outside the church, to share with them the gift of God's love. Tonight, we're very blessed to have Sayedna Nicholas with us. Bishop Nicholas was born on August 15, 1944, in Patterson, New Jersey. After completing a BA at St. Anselm's College in Manchester, New Hampshire, and a BD from St. John's Seminary in Brighton, Massachusetts, he was ordained a priest for the Diocese of Newton, Massachusetts, on May 10, 1970. On April 21, 1989, Bishop Samuel was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of the Diocese of Newton. In June 2011, the Synod of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church nominated him as Eparch of Newton to succeed Archbishop Cyril Bustros. An active speaker and author, Bishop Samra has written extensively on subjects of ecumenism, Christian leadership, and stewardship. Please stand and join me in welcoming our speaker this evening, His Excellency Bishop Nicholas Samra. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. How are you all doing tonight? Good. So am I. I walked in the door and had a good surprise beside seeing all of you people tonight. A classmate of mine from high school happens to be living here. And he came up to me and he said, I didn't know who he was. He said, we went to high school together. Where is he? Cass? And here he is back there. And 
49 years ago, I didn't see, I, we haven't seen each other in 49 years. I don't think he recognized me, but he saw my name, because I wouldn't have recognized him either. Interesting where we go in this life and what happens to us. Just this week, I had a professional photographer come to take my portrait picture for our parishes. Each parish wants a picture of the bishop on their walls someplace, either in the hall or in the vestibule of the church. So I had the photographer come to take a picture and I had to chuckle about it because that was going to be my opening lines tonight. Not about my picture, certainly, but about going to a photographer for family pictures. When you go for a portrait, Everybody sits down and everybody has to look good. The ladies have to put their makeup on and the guys have to comb their hair. And everybody has to look perfect and the photographer places you the way you want them and which way you should look and turn this way and turn that way. Sometimes a, a family portrait may take a couple of hours, I don't know. But, but when the proofs come, many people will say, I don't like them. Why? Well, I'm not photogenic. I don't look good in the camera. Why? Well, I look fat in the camera. <laughs> Sorry, camera doesn't lie. If you look fat, you are fat. <laughs> camera doesn't lie. Camera doesn't lie. So people always want to take a picture and then tell the photographer, now touch up those wrinkles and touch up those blemishes and make me look a little bit better. I don't want to see me as I am but I want to see myself as a model, maybe a Hollywood model or a star, you know, somebody from a TV commercial, they always look so good, okay? Sometimes we want the photographer to become a plastic surgeon. <laughs> yes, it sounds funny, and it is, but that's what goes on in our world today. But this is an example of some deeper things our idea of who we are and what we are. Very, very important image. Okay? Most of us put on masks today. People wear masks a lot. There's the real person and the person they'd like to be sometimes or they think that they are. And many people do that. Many people look to the movie stars and to the personalities and sometimes to the political personalities and uh, try to dress like them. Clothing fads develop very quickly, you know, by television today. <clears throat> you need a new fad to start it, and you just put it on TV, and boy, does it spread very, very rapidly. We live in a society <clears throat> that's basically not very Christian, and that society is telling us how we should think and how we should feel and what we should do. So when people ask themselves, what's life for? What's it all about? They look to TV. They look to singles magazines. They look for designer fashions. And sometimes looking all in the wrong places. All in the wrong places. According to the scripture... Things are a little bit different. Things are not a little bit, but a lot different. In the tradition of our church, we have a place to look. And that's the scripture. If we don't know God, we'll never understand who we are and what we're meant to be. Now we think about God in the ways that we really can't comprehend with our basic, simple human mind. But we know God is in Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that God always existed, even before we came into being. Even before the universe came into being, God was. And this love of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was a circular type thing. God the Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Spirit, they all loved each other, and the circle kept going around and around, and they love. But love, in a sense, needs to be generative. It needs to give life. And God recognized that. So at a point in history, he brings the universe into being 
and he creates in the universe all of the planets and the sun and the moon and everything we see around us and so far away from us and he creates the earth and places on it all the animals and the trees and everything else and he creates human beings to share his love so that this love that was with the Trinity now can flow over to others, can flow over to all of us. We read in Genesis, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them, he's speaking men and women, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle and over all the wild animals and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that move on the earth. Very clear then that God created humanity in his image and likeness. God becomes the reality, and in a sense, we are the shadow. We are the shadow. We can only understand what we're meant to be by knowing Him, God, and His way. Not all of the other ways that society proposes to us. This doesn't mean that to make sense of the world, we need to understand God. If it did, we'd never get anywhere. Because he is incomprehensible. We cannot understand him. The fathers of our church knew that God was incomprehensible and they accepted that as it was. Instead, they tried to understand the human condition in God's terms. Our human condition as God would see that. And the fathers of our Eastern Church that I represent, as well as all the whole Catholic tradition, sees God's understanding of our place in creation from these verses of Genesis that I read a moment ago. God created man and woman in his image and likeness. The Bible expresses it in a very special way. God said, let there be light. Or let there be plants, and let there be animals. And they began to exist. But for us, there was a difference. For human beings, there was a difference. He says, let us make man in our image, in our own image, and after our likeness. We're different than everything else that exists. Because of the one after whom we are patterned. So these two words are very big in Eastern spirituality and theology. In the West they tend to put them together, lump them together in theology. But in the East we have a difference. When you look at the word image and you look at the word likeness, you might think they're the same. What's your image? Like I said in the beginning, you want to see your image? Have somebody take your picture. That's what you look like. Like it or not, that's what you look like. That's your image. Okay? Can't change it. Like it or not. Likeness is a little bit different. Likeness, a child likes to, once in a while, play mommy and daddy. So when mommy and daddy go out, they go to the closet and they get out all the clothes and the shoes and they walk around playing mommy and daddy. Sometimes... They're acting like their parents. A number of years ago, when they first started, but most will recognize, when they first started to try the cigarette, stopping cigarettes on the TV commercials, if you remember, I remember one particular one for smoking. 
that a father and his son were fishing at the banks of a little river. And the father put down his pole, needed a break, and he pulled out a pack of marlboro and he put it in his mouth and lit it up. And the little boy looked at the father and opened up his little candy cigarettes and put it in his mouth. He was acting like his father. And that's very normal. So there's, a, there's something different in image and likeness. He's not the exact image. Even when children look exactly like their parents, you think, there's still something different. There's still not the image. The image is you are unique. So we can see that there is a difference. According to scripture, we are meant both to resemble God, to have something in our makeup that is his image, and also to be like God. Well, when we think about what is our image and is it God, I look in the mirror and I say, thank God, God doesn't look like me. But that's not what we're thinking about and talking about. We are like God. We are the image of God because we have reason, which he gave us. The right to make choices, right or wrong, right or wrong. And that's what the God images in us. That's what the God images with us. And so we have natural capabilities of godliness. The image we know and we can communicate. We can be creative. We can be dynamic. We can relate to others. These are images of God. These abilities are in us always. But there are ways also that we are like God. Or we resemble God. And so we have a natural dignity, value, and beauty because we are his image. But we also are meant to be like him and use those capabilities that he gave us to be more loving, to be more compassionate, to be more forgiving, to give of ourselves, to be selfless and not selfish. Okay? And that means we are meant to grow and become even more conformed to his likeness. Well, Adam and Eve messed it all up. God's plan for creation was not what we have today. God's plan for creation was to create everything perfect without ever a problem. And he put Adam and Eve in this garden of paradise and animals could be in that garden and they could see the lions and they could pet them just like they pet a dog without the lion attacking anybody. And they had all the flowers and all the trees and all the gardens. And God said to them, anything you want is yours. Perfect. Everything was perfect. Just don't touch that one tree. you know from your own children. Don't do that. And what do they do? They were tempted. They were tempted. And they touched the tree. And they ate from that tree of good and evil. They were tempted because they were told if you eat that, you become more godly by the serpent. And they did. And they messed it up a little bit. But then we stop and think. They created sin, Adam and Eve. They created death, which is a follow-up of sin. Death was an insult and still is an insult to God. It wasn't part of his plan. We were supposed to be living in a perfect world. But it got messed up. And we, the followers, the continuation of Adam and Eve, come into this world with this brokenness. Sometimes it's called original sin. But it's a brokenness that God still lives in our life. He still lives in our life. But we are not always so godly. So God conceived us very truly human as we are when we are living according to his model which he created. We can only be ourselves if we fulfill that model. 
And we can only understand what God means for us and how we should be. Only then we know how to relate to our inner feelings. We know how to relate to each other and to all creation. And we know how to relate to God. When you think about it, being like God isn't something that could just be in us full blown. If it were, we'd be God. It's something we have to grow into. So the fathers of our church, again, stress that God did not create humanity as he created other things, already completely and perfect. Only the human race, God created unfinished. Everything else was finished. A rock is a rock, and it's not going to change. A horse is a horse. And it's not going to change. Okay? But we are changeable. We are the unfinished creation of God. St. Basil, 4th century bishop, says, Man is a creature which has received the command to become God. We are still being created. We are not finished products. With the stamp of approval. You may have seen the saying on a card many years ago, please be patient with me, God isn't finished with me yet. It was very popular, I think, in the 70s and 80s. But in a a sense, it's very true, because we're not finished. We're still growing in the likeness, coming closer and closer to God. We are meant to naturally turn toward Him. Like a sunflower... If you plant sunflowers, it follows the sun. When the sun starts to move in our universe in the sky, going around, the sunflower moves too. And then when the sun sets, the sunflower closes up for a while. When the sun comes up again, the sunflower opens and follows the sun. This is the basic drive that should be in us. So to summarize, we're only saying that God created us in his image, we resemble him, and in his likeness, we are called to be like him. That means we're called to grow. We're called to grow. And to take part in this lifelong process of becoming more and more like him. Because God created humanity in that beautiful garden, of Eden, he gave Adam and Eve and all mankind three basic jobs or tasks. The first one, he made us stewards. A steward is a manager. Comes from an old English word, the uh, wards of the sty, the pigsties. But we use that. He made us stewards of creation. We're here to take care of the rest of the universe. A steward is not an owner. He can't do whatever he wants. He has to do what the manager wants. And the manager happens to be God. His job is to take care of things and to manage them well. The second job that God gave humanity was to become prophets. Prophets. Only they would recognize him as he shows himself in creation. You know, God chose prophets in the Old Testament to speak for him. Prophet means one who speaks for God. And he would choose certain prophets to go out and tell the people, hey, fix up your lives. Uh, You're not following God properly. We're looking into creation. So we're prophets. We were called to be prophets. And only we can do that in the creation of God. No other aspect of his creation can be a prophet. We are to discern what God is doing in this world today and... Attempt to live it and attempt to develop it. Finally, the third thing or the third task of what God gave humanity, he made us all priests. People who would use everything in a sacramental way. Offering them to God and finding God in them. Living in this way mankind would grow more and more like God himself. Living God 
in a sacramental way, making everything holy that God gives us. Well, poor Adam and Eve, they failed. We know the story from Genesis. We've read it many times. They failed as stewards because they wanted creation the way they wanted it. And they ate of the tree they were told not to touch. They attempted to become their own owners and not to manage what God wanted. They failed as prophets because they didn't discern what God wanted. Okay? Instead, they followed the first voice they heard, which happened to be Satan the serpent. And they missed the boat also as priests because they began using holy things in creation for their own ends and not for God's. Big difference. And that doesn't make a sacrament when you use something holy in an ungodly way. It's a sacrilege. So the results that came into the world were disharmony instead of harmony. They began blaming each other. When God spoke to Adam, he said, hey, wait a minute, it's not for, she was the one who told me to do it. And then Eve said, wait a minute, it wasn't me, it was the serpent who told me to do it. They began blaming each other for what they did. For the big mess they got into. Shame and lust followed. And all the other inhuman qualities that we've come to think as being very natural. That all came from sin. Sin entered the world and the potential to become like God was put on hold. We call that the fall. The fall of humanity. So sin and weakness are not natural to us. In fact, they're not part of our human nature in what God wants. They are the brokenness of a distorted and scarred humanity. It's a distortion that comes from abusing our real nature. We can think of many abuses that wouldn't work in our life. If you wanted to use a concrete mixer to wash clothes, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Okay, That's not what it's meant for. You have to use what it's meant for. Sin is a misusing of ourselves. It's a misusing of ourselves. It's ludicrous because it's not in harmony with the nature to which we were first called. After the image and likeness of God. Sin isn't the breaking of rules, like so many times we hear, but doing of the impossible, trying to live independently of God. That's what sin is all about. God is the giver of creation. He is the model of our nature. And the one toward whom we are still going. Cut off from Him, we have no life. Not the kind of life that we're certainly meant to have, at least. It's like a person kept alive on a respirator today in hospitals. He's breathing, yes, but there's more to life than just breathing. Much, much more. Adam tried to build his own world to become for himself the standard of what ought to be. He was frustrated because it was impossible. He was out of step with creation, disjointed, out of focus. A natural born poet or musician does his thing with ease. Poetry, certain people have a beautiful knack for poetry or for music, writing music, singing music. It's very natural to them. But we don't do our thing reflecting God easily anymore because sin came into our world. Something is very wrong. What we are made as in the image and likeness of God at least the image remains. Once you get the image of God in you, you can never lose it. Become the greatest sinner in the world. I don't care what you do. You can't lose the image of God. But you will certainly tarnish the likeness. And you're no longer like God. So the process of becoming like God was put on hold. 
We still resemble our father in his image, but we sure don't act like him. As we say in our funeral service, in our Byzantine tradition, you who with your own hand have fashioned me from nothingness and adorned me with your divine image. And when I transgressed your commandment, you cast me down to the dust whereof I had been made. Deign, O Lord, to restore me to that likeness, so that my original beauty may be renewed in me. We carry on this movement even till today. We inherit this from the situation of Adam. We're born in the world that's out of focus. In the Eastern tradition, we don't really have the guilt of Adam and Eve, but we come into the world with brokenness. We are prone to good or to evil. We have that opportunity now. And that's what godliness is all about, by the way, to make a decision. We confirm Adam's deeds and his own sins, even in our own times. And we carry them further into the universe, far away from what it should be. This is an atmosphere of brokenness. An atmosphere of brokenness. Sometimes we call it original sin. I, I don't like that word original sin because in the American mentality, the word sin means something I do. Okay? You commit a sin. I just don't like that word original sin. I think it's more this brokenness that we speak about, that we get from Adam and Eve, but not something that I did. It's not my fault, but I come into it because I'm there down the line, ancestors, all the way. This is what it was sometimes called, and still is, some people call it. It's not an inherited guilt from someone else's sin, but it's an atmosphere of brokenness. It's an atmosphere of brokenness. All around us, we find the brokenness that touches us right from the womb of our mother. It affects everything. Nothing escapes from that brokenness. That's why St. Paul says, All creation groans and is in agony, even until now. The universe is waiting for us to become what we're supposed to be. Until that happens, everything is out of kilter, so to say. And it will stay that way until we're back where we belong. Like the prodigal son in the parable that Christ told, when we come back and belong to the Father fully. So we're in this fallen condition. Totally unnatural to us. So then we say, well, was God really being fair? Just because he told them, don't touch that tree, and they did, it wasn't the greatest sin in the world for them wasn't the worst thing in the world. And it certainly wasn't. But they chose it. So God had to create a new plan. But before he created that new plan for them, we see that brokenness. Even till today. One of the characteristics that marks our culture today is part of that brokenness. And that is individualism. Everybody wants to be an individual. They want to be themselves. They define themselves by what separates them from other people. Oh, I have more money, or I have more power, or I'm more popular than the next guy. Okay? That's individualism. I'm smarter, or I dress better, or I dance better, or I sing better. I was telling the children today about singing and liturgy. I said, when your choir is the children choir and the adult choir leads the singing... Don't just let them sing. You sing too when you're praising God. So I said to them, when I tell adults that, sometimes the adults will say, well, I don't have a good voice. So I tell them, well, sing louder. <laughs> so they said to me, but I just told you I don't have a good voice. I said, I know. Sing louder so God can hear one of the possible mistakes he made. <laughs> and maybe correct it. Everyone can sing if they really want to. But individualism came in. Now, you know that, get, that card game, numero uno? Everybody wants to be numero uno in the world? That's what the serpent did. 
by tempting them. Hey, you're going to be just like God. That's why he told you don't do it. That's why he told you don't do it. But that individualism is because of sin. But the gospel that we read, the words of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ is totally different. St. Paul says, you are not your own. We are not individuals before everything else. We are persons, and there's a difference. Individuality separates. We define ourselves in terms of what makes us different from others, and that makes disharmony. Persons are known because of their relationship to each other. There's a difference between an individual and a person. I had some argument about that with one of our deacons in the last couple of months, and he's a doctor, and he just couldn't understand what I was trying to get across. But we can see in many traditions of our church, and you see it in some of the, even the Western European traditions, the names Michelson and Jackson, meaning the son of Jack or the son of Michael. In the Middle East, we usually relate to somebody and call a person by the name of his first son. So the man's name might be George, but his son might be Joseph. So we'll call him father of Joseph, Abu Joseph, and Im Joseph. Because there's a relationship. There's a relationship there. It's not individuality. Relationship is like the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All relating to each other. They're not individuals. They can't act separately. God can't act separately. Each person is a Trinity. We do that in our mind. The Father created, the Son saved, the Holy Spirit sanctifies. But they all did it together. So the relationship is very, very important. Even when the Arab tribes were starting to get united in the 1930s, and the founder of the state of Saudi Arabia, he never used his own name. He was always called Ibn Saud, the son of Saud, Saudi Arabia, okay? the son of Saud. So there was a relationship, family, and that's the Trinity. But here we are, scattered, disoriented, fragmented from each other. And in everything, once innocence is lost, it's never the same again. Mankind has tried to live its own way, diverging itself from the way of the master, from the plan of God. And the result is disorder, chaos. Chaos. I like that word chaos because when I was the rector of the seminary, we had one seminarian who was very particular about putting dishes in the dishwasher. Some of you might be very particular about that. And he had the cups all lined up with the handles of the cups all turned one way. And then he had all the small dishes here, and he had all the big dishes here. And then most of the seminarians, would, they would have something, a snack, and they'd throw it in the dishwasher, and it was all... Thing. And he would come down, and he'd look at it, ah, chaos, chaos, chaos! <laughs> so it got to the point where... After he would reorganize it and go to his room, the other guys, just to agitate him more, would come down and rearrange it all into chaos once again. Chaos. But that's what happens in our world. We're living in a chaotic world, just like a dishwasher when you don't line it up perfectly. Okay. Try plugging your toaster into a grapefruit. Does it work? If it does, you let me know the secret, please. Okay? You won't certainly get toast. Left to our own devices, and we've tried this so often, we can't find where we're going. Adam tried to plug into his own mind, and it didn't work, because it wasn't God's way. Nothing was right again. Well, the fathers of the church speak about living in three dimensions then. The body, the soul, and the spirit. Perhaps we've heard the terms body and soul, but the East speaks a little bit more about the mind too. The body is meant to be directed by the soul or the mind. And the mind is meant to take its life from the spirit or the inmost being. And this spirit is meant to take its life from the spirit of God. The Spirit of God. So we're fully human. Only when we live and fulfill in this way what God wants us to be and to do. 
our innermost being, then from the inside and all the way out. Well, with the fall, the body went its own way. We find the body dictating to the mind. It craves certain things. That's why we have a, a lot of obese people, because they crave and they eat. Their body wants it. Gluttony and lust come into the world. We try to find life in the body. But intelligence doesn't make us do everything okay if we seek it only in the mind. You can have the greatest intelligent mind in the world and if it's not working along with the body and the spirit, you don't get along. Then we focus on pride. Oh, I know everything. I'm so brilliant and smart. Pride comes into the world and here we are. I might sound like things sound pretty bad now, huh? <laughs> Not really. Not really. Because God had a plan. He created a new plan. And the new plan was something even more unique than his initial plan of creation. God, new plan, he decided to come into the world himself and live as a human being. To enter into the human condition and thank God he did it in his way and not in ours. We probably would not have thought of such a great thing. Saint Nicholas Cabasilas, a spiritual writer of the 14th century, expresses beautifully, God is not content to remain where he is and to summon, like a slave, the one he loves so dearly. He comes down and seeks for himself. The Almighty stoops to the lowliness of our poor nature. He comes himself, declares his love for us, and it seems almost that he is asking a favor of us. When we refuse, he does not withdraw. He is not wounded by our rejection. Rebuffed, he waits at the door. All to show his abiding love. He takes on himself all these humiliations and he dies. This is what we call the incarnation. The taking of flesh of God in a human way. The high point of God's plan for creation. It's not so easy to really understand. A little story may help us too. A Hindu man, a very holy Hindu man, was contemplating after being taught by some Christians about becoming a Christian. And he basically figured out that he could accept everything Christianity taught. But he had one big problem. Incarnation. Well, that's a big problem for somebody, right? For him it was. But it's a very core issue of our faith. And he couldn't figure out why God, in his mind so far and beyond us in controlling the universe, this great power, why he would even waste his time to become a human being like us. That was, in his mind, that was just so unfathomable. God becomes a human and as he was contemplating this idea, walking on the great plains in India, where there were giant anthills, not the little ones in the cracks that we see sometimes, but big ones in the plains of India, and walking around thinking, how, why would God become man? Why, why, why? All day he kept thinking. And as the sun began to set, the shadows started to change. And his shadow now was cast over all the ants that were outside of their home, outside of the anthill. Well, they didn't know. All they saw this darkness come over them, they ran. They began to scurry back to their hill to take... They were afraid. So they wanted to go back into the... Maybe something would happen to them. So they started to run. And he saw them running away, and he knew they were running away from him. And he said to himself out loud, he says, You know, those poor ants are running away from me. I respect all of God's life. I wouldn't even put my foot and step on one little ant to kill it. I respect life. He said, then, he said, I wish, I wish I could become an ant right now and speak ant language and say to them, 
I love you. Don't be afraid of me. I won't kill you. And then the light bulb, bung, bung, bung. Ah, oh, that's why God became man. To tell us that he's just like us and he loves us. Now he could accept the incarnation. We call it taking of flesh of Jesus Christ. The word of God becomes one of us. He takes on our whole fallen nature and he heals it. He heals it. He becomes for us the perfect image of the Father. He fulfills what Adam was supposed to be or was supposed to do. Jesus becomes the new Adam, a new creation, bringing us back in line with the original plan that was destroyed by Adam. That's what we celebrate when we have the feast of the birth of Christ and the manifestations of Christ in the flesh. He comes into our midst to become one of us. We're back in the garden again, in a sense, when Christ comes. We repeat these ideas every time we sing the various hymns of Christmas. In our Eastern Melkite Byzantine tradition, we sing, Bethlehem, get ready, for Eden has been opened for all. Ephrata, be alert, for the tree of life has blossomed forth from the virgin in the cave. Her womb has become a spiritual paradise wherein the divine fruit was planted. And if we eat of it, we shall live and not die like Adam. Christ is coming forth to bring back to life the likeness that had been lost in the beginning. Christ is the perfect likeness of God. Not only does he resemble him in his human nature as we all do, but Christ is also like him in all things. He who sees me, Jesus said to Philip, sees the Father. In Christ we see perfectly who and what God is and who and what God wants us to be. What he is, is what human nature was meant to be from the beginning. Christ comes to bring everything back to the original plan, which was put on hold with Adam's sin. Before Christ, everything was getting more and more separated. Now a new force comes in. The force of the life of Christ. The fathers call this the recapitulation of all things. Everything is finding its place in Christ as the head. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he is the image of the invisible God, speaking of Christ. The firstborn of all creatures. In him, everything continues in being. It pleased God to make absolute fullness reside in him and by means of him to reconcile everything in his person both on heaven and on earth. So Christ now is the center of reality. The center of reality. Everything has been made through him. Everything has been revealed through him. Everything will find fulfillment in him. While he was walking around on the roads of Galilee and teaching and preaching, people didn't see that very clearly. He didn't carry a sign on his back announcing that, but they knew he was different. They knew that much. It was only after his resurrection that we begin to see how Christ is the perfect man and to see that his coming was so that we might have new life and that we might have the likeness restored once again. The likeness of God in us. St. Athanasius says, He, the true and natural Son of God, bears all in Himself so that we might all bear in ourselves the only God. 
our pattern, our model, and if you want to put a mask on, is Christ. The person of Christ. That's why St. Peter, in his epistle, could write that we become sharers of the divine nature. This is what we call in our Eastern tradition, theosis, a Greek word in English now, meaning becoming deified or becoming divinized, theosis, becoming more and more like God, having God living in our life. We become more and more like Him. St. Irenaeus, one of the early fathers of the church, expressed it, God became man so that we might become God. And that can sound to some people with rigid theology thinking a little wrong. We're not going to become God, but we can certainly share in the life of God that emanates from Him, and we become godly. Maybe it's a better translation if you don't like becoming God. Becoming godly. Christ's followers only began to realize that later on. And the plan took place with the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles 50 days after Pascha when the Spirit came down upon the apostles, enlightened them, and imbued them now to go out. And no longer were they afraid. They went out and they began to preach Jesus Christ whom they knew and tell people about them. We see in the icon of Pentecost the Spirit coming down upon the church. The twelve apostles gathered around, tongues of fire over them. Sometimes the Mother of God seated among them. Below them is a figure of a man with his hands outstretched. We call that in the iconography cosmos. Cosmos means the world, the universe in a sense. And that figure represents mankind. That the Spirit comes upon mankind to make mankind the reality of Jesus Christ in the world. Remember I, a few minutes ago I said something about we are body, soul, and spirit. Okay? Meant to share God's life in our spirit. We're not fully human until we do that. Unless our spirit is plugged into God's spirit, we're like a light bulb that has no electricity. If you ever looked at a stained glass window at night, it doesn't seem very alive but put a light behind it, or when the sun comes up and the light shines through, all those colors become alive because we're seeing the light of God. And that's what shines into us. We are sons and daughters of God. Everything we do as Christians then depends on that fact of the incarnation, that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And we become the process of restoring our divine likeness once again. Making us sharers of the divine nature. We don't have necessarily all the laws, don't do this and do that. We don't really have to worry about that so much if we take the life of Christ and pattern it. And live it as he forgave, we forgive. As he loved, we love. As he was compassionate, we're compassionate. Today we read the story of the Samaritan who helped the guy beat up by some robbers. He wasn't the good guy, the Samaritan. He wasn't recognized as being very good. But he was the one that did it because there was compassion. He was the image of Jesus Christ handling and taking care of this guy. So God sent the Spirit to us so that Christ could live in us after this incarnation event. He lived on the earth about 33 years, they say. And then he disappeared. He went back to God. And it was from that point on that his disciples, and all the way down to us today, continued to look on how we live Christ. And we know from our tradition, not only do we live Christ, we become Christ. When we share in the Eucharist of his body and blood, we form one body, the body of Christ, and we become Christ in the world. When we're baptized, we enter into this new life of a Christian church. We put on Christ. In fact, we sing, as St. Paul says, all of you baptized in Christ, put on Christ. Like we're putting on our robes. We wear Christ. And then we're anointed with chrism. 
chrismation, some call it confirmation, to become another anointed one like Christ was. So we were ordained to the ministry of the laity, the priesthood of the laity. So we're called once again to come back to being stewards of the earth. Now it's in our hands. We are called to be managers for God once again. We're called through the Spirit acting in us. We can't act all on our own. And the Eastern Church calls that synergy. We share and God shares. And we call that a working together. A synergy between God and humanity. And that's how we begin to live our Christ life. So where does it all lead? God's spirit lives in us and works in us. But where does it all lead us? Once again, shows us that our life is not finished. That we're still growing closer and closer to God. And it'll never end even on this earth. Even after we die, we can still grow closer and closer to God. The West has always called that purgatory. You're going to burn in all this fire. The East never accepted that mentality. It's a growing closer and closer to God. You still have that opportunity to become like God. And not until, not until the full second coming will it ever be finalized. St. Gregory of Nyssa, another 4th century father of the church, used the events of the exodus of the Jews from Egypt on their way to the Holy Land, what became the Holy Land, to describe this whole idea. He said that our baptism was the beginning of our journey. Like the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. See the water involvement. They were entering a new way of life. Baptism is a new way of life. With only a vague idea of where it would take them. It took them 40 years to find the land. They really wandered around a lot. And you look at the map and all they had to do was just go that way. But they didn't. But of course the image of Finding God sometimes takes time. They wandered for 40 years in the desert. And our lives are like that. We wander. We go on and on, struggling. Trying to make progress. Sometimes falling back. But always God makes His presence evident to us. We have the holy mysteries or sacraments of the church. To experience God in our lives at birth. When we need reconciliation. In marriage or the nations, whatever it may be, we experience Christ in our life. We have the tradition of the church as our companions, just like the Israelites had the pillar of fire and the cloud. They would follow that. So we follow the mysteries or sacraments of the church, and we follow the tradition of our church, oral and written. Finally, we reach the promised land as they did, took them 40 years. It's going to take us even longer sometimes. But only after we've crossed the Jordan and come to the age to come will it all take place. We call this the final transfiguration when we, again, are now back to the perfect image and to the perfect likeness of God. We will be like the burning bush of Exodus It was totally permeated with the life of God, but it never burnt up. Fire was burning it, but it never burnt up. It wasn't cremated. We still are who we are. And the bush, the burning bush, was still a weed. But it was filled with God. It didn't become a rose bush. It stayed the burning bush. But it became transfigured because it was filled with God. So the end of this process, a theosis, becoming godly or divinized, the end of it is to be transfigured so that we can radiate the divine nature in which God has chosen us to share. One of the great feasts of our church, the Feast of the Transfiguration, speaks about this a little bit. When God took three of his apostles up to the top of the mountain, the other one stayed on the bottom. And 
he let them see a glimpse of his glory of the divinity. But they wanted to stay there. They only saw a glimpse, but they had to go back to the world. They had to go back down the hill and live the life of God. If you saw that glory, and we have to, then you have to become like it and begin to live it more and more. And one of the things that our Eastern Church does on that Feast of the Transfiguration that even helps us with that understanding of being transfigured is we bless grapes. Where they didn't have grapes in some of the Eastern Churches, they bless the first fruits. Okay, we bless the grape. Why? It's the season in August when we celebrate the feast for the harvest of grapes. That's one thing. But secondly, when a grape grows on a vine, and I'm sure most of you have seen that, and when you were young, you saw them, and your mother said, don't touch them yet, they're not ripe. <laughs> and you picked it, and you ate it, and you spit it out. Tasted terrible. Tasted terrible. But, with God's good light and sun and some good water and God's blessings, that bunch of grapes begins to ripen. And now you taste it, and it's so sweet and delicious. It gives life. But there's more to it. I like to tell the children, do you ever hear the story of the grape that became God? And they look at you kind of funny. A grape can become God? Sure, sure it can. That grape and all his brothers and sisters on the vine are picked and they're crushed. And they're sent to the fermenter and it's fermented and made into wine. And the wine comes to the church along with bread and it's offered at the holy table to God. Thank you for giving us life. And here's the symbols of it. The church prays together, all the people, the priests, the bishop, the deacons, and God acts. That's why we call our liturgy, sometimes called in the West the Mass, we call it the liturgy, but we call it the divine liturgy. There's other liturgy forms. And if God doesn't act, it's not divine. We propose it, and then God reacts to our proposal, and he changes that bread and wine, that grape now, and all of its cousins and brothers and sisters, into his body and blood. The grape became God. And then we partake of it. And then we become godly. And we become another Christ. One of the monastics of the Eastern Church from the Russian tradition, they called him the Starets, the old man who had wisdom, was teaching his young novice monks about what's the holiest part of the liturgy. The holiest and best part Oh, and everyone had an idea. The first novice jumped up and said, Oh, it's when the gospel is read because Jesus speaks to us. Another one says, No, no. It's when we say our creed. I believe in one God. When we profess what we believe. And another one said, No. It's when the bread and wine is changed into the body and blood of Christ. And another one said, No. It's when we receive it. And finally the elder monk, Stadat, says to them, ah, You are all an ounce right. I tell you, the holiest and most important part of the liturgy is when you open the doors of the church and leave. And they looked at him. He said, it's all over. He said, no, it just begins. When you go outside to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ to the community, through his word and through his sacrament, and begin to live him with other people and to be more like him, then the liturgy just begins. You come inside to experience the holiness and now you go back into the world to make the world as holy as you experience inside. We're called back to be right on track again after this whole mess up by Adam and Eve. And we are called to be stewards once again. Managers of God's world. To take care of God's universe. Not ours. Nothing is ours. Even the clothes we wear are not ours. You come into the world naked and you go out of the world naked. Some people rent clothes to put on the dead people when they go in the boxes instead of wearing their own. Nothing belongs to you. The money you have in the bank doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. He lets you use it for a while. There's another good little story. I'll end almost with that. 
of a guy who never did anything good in his life. And he died and he was going to hell. And you know, in the imagery of hell, there's a river. It's called the River Styx. S-T-Y-X, okay? And to get in to hell, you had to cross the river. And there was a toll booth there. This was written by an English author. And there's a toll booth. And all the little devils, toll keepers, were sleeping when this guy arrived. So, he crossed over the bridge without paying toll to hell. When they woke up, they see another person in hell. Hey, how did he get here? Did you get the money from him? No, I was asleep. Did you get it? No, I was asleep. They all had to admit. He said, well, one little devil says, well, we got to punish him more. He got in here without even, he did nothing good in life, and he got in here free. So they said, well, how can you punish him more? Hell is the worst punishment. The little devil, sneaky, said, ha, 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 let's send him back to the world for a few minutes and let him see what his children are doing with the money that he left. A great punishment. A great punishment. So we're called to be stewards of what God gave us. Again, like Adam and Eve, we're called to be the prophets. To recognize God in our society. And as he manifested himself to us in creation, to discern God's presence in creation, to teach it, to live it, and make sure we certainly will it ourselves. And we're called to be priests. To use everything that God has given us in a holy way and not sacrilegiously. So our role through this whole incarnation event is to be what Adam and Eve were supposed to be but lost. Stewards, prophets, and priests. The call for all of us. And may you live that call in a tremendous way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sayedna. We're going to take our normal break. You know, Sayedna, I was thinking in the back, I know you have a lot to deal with going up to the bishop's conference, governing the church, as some of these things can be tedious. So while you're up there, and you're dealing with these difficult things, close your eyes and think back to Holy Transfiguration this morning and this evening here at St. James. The church is very much alive. Very much alive. If I, if I close my eyes <laughs> at the problem, I'll probably sleep for the whole meeting. <laughs> that might not be a bad thing. <laughs> Meetings <Okay>. get boring. <laughs> All right. Our usual rules apply. Uh, don't take my mic. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your talk. I was just wondering if you could uh, talk briefly about why God created Adam and Eve without this atmosphere of brokenness, if he would eventually have to redeem us. From our perspective, it seems like the plan B is actually much better. Why wouldn't he have led with that? I don't think we really know for sure, but his plan, plan A, was so that everything would be perfect, just as God was perfect. Again, he had to allow his creation to be like him and that means to choose what they want if he did not allow them to choose then he wouldn't be God okay then he wouldn't be God if he controlled it all so he put them there and they had the right to choose had they chosen everything would have been like it is we'd still be running around the garden naked and picking fruit and eating it and having a good time whatever and there certainly wouldn't be all the issues of our life. Plan B, I think, came out better than plan A, like, like you say, because God enters into humanity. God enters. But I'm sure he had entered also with Adam and Eve, because we hear him talking in the garden with them and everything else. So it's just, it just uh, a way to heal the brokenness. To heal the brokenness. How we overcome the temptation of the devil. How we overcome the temptation of the devil? By looking at Christ and patterning ourselves on Christ. We are human and we're going to be tempted. So we have to begin to think of what Christ was. Because he loved, we must love. When we're hurt by somebody, we must forgive. 
And that's what Christ did. So that's how we overcome it, by looking and making Christ the reality in our life and not accepting to be the individuals that we are. That's what happens. It's hard. It's hard. It's difficult. But it can be done. And it takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of prayer, speaking with God on a regular basis, developing our life, getting involved in our church communities, practicing and witnessing the sacraments of our church, teaching our families about God, living in Him in the home. The home is the first church. So much can be done, but when we push him out and try other ways, the temptations become harder. But when we act like God, they become easier to handle. So now I have a uh, kind of a basic catechetical question from Helen. I don't know where she's writing from. She emailed in, but I think it's good for us to hear your answer. So if Jesus took on our fallen nature and died for our sins, did he have original sin? And if not, why was he baptized? First of all, Jesus took on our human nature, everything like us but sin. So he did not have what we would call the original sin, the brokenness. And why was he baptized? He wasn't baptized like we baptize today. We took that. He had a ritual that was done by the Jewish people of their day. And that the plunging into water at the time of Christ by the Jewish people was a sign of a change. And it's the prefigure of our baptism, of course. So yes, he chose, he chose to do that, to share the humanity of his people. But he had no sin, and he didn't need it. But he chose to do it, to show that he was much like them. And then, of course, he developed, or the church developed through Jesus, the symbolic meaning of baptism, entrance into the body of Christ at a later date. It's not the same as the Jewish symbolism of baptism. That was a little different. Bishop, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Just this past week, I had a man tell me that the more he lives, the more experience he gets, the more evidence he sees for the total depravity of mankind. What are the particular pitfalls of this point of view, and what is the, the great hope offered by the Catholic view of man? I think our faith is very, very clear. If we take the Christian life, understand it, dissect it, live it, we will start to uncover some of these depravities that exist in our world today. We're living in a very difficult world, that's for sure. And we have political differences and philosophical differences. This existed all the time. But if we live the real message of the gospel and participate in the life of Christ through our churches and through the sacramental mysteries, then we are on the better road. And little by little, these depravities can be rectified. But we have to see them in the light of Christianity. That's not the easiest thing in the world, which we're witnessing in our world today, with euthanasia, abortions, and all of this stuff, that is totally against God. Totally against God. Because see, he's in control. It's him. It's not our bodies. We can't do with our bodies what we want to do with them. It's what God wants us to do. So we can make that choice, but if it's against God's wishes, it's depraved. So yes, the Christian faith, the Catholic Church, teaches us this. And when the church teaches us, it becomes the master. That's one good thing we have in the Catholic Orthodox tradition, that we just don't open the Bible and read a passage and say, oh, that's what it means, and it means this, it means that. No, the church becomes the teacher. And when the church teaches, we follow. We have to learn it, digest it, and make it part of our life. But then depravity can be handled. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank we you. hope you'll come back soon. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, 
please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.